Hello? Hello? We are in business. Good morning. This is the third Sunday. It's actually the fourth Sunday of Lent, but it's the third Sunday I've been on this teaching series about really looking at grief. Um, so the sermon theme for today is make it make sense. Make it make sense. Alexander Rosas, who lives in Milwaukee, recalls fond memories of her dad. It was Thanksgiving 1965, and her family had recently migrated to the U.S. from Colombia. Her mother hits the ground running, wanting to assimilate as quickly as possible. It's Thanksgiving time, and her mom wants to have a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. Her mom sends her dad to the grocery store to make a run to get all the ingredients that she's going to need to make this American Thanksgiving dinner. In a large family, Alexander feels like she rarely gets her dad's attention. But the one place she's always been able to get her dad's attention is going to the grocery store. And so they head to the grocery store and they put stuff in. She knows where stuff is and they get all the way up to the cash register. Her dad pulls out his wallet and then he puts it away. He leaves all of the groceries in the store and walks out of the grocery store. He heads to the tavern close by. Now, back in the day, it was okay to bring your child to a tavern. Not so today. But back in 1965, a different time up in Milwaukee. So Alexander is not bothered because as long as her dad is going to the tavern and she's going to get her candy bar, who cares about groceries? She's five years old. They go in the tavern. Her dad gets a beer, and she's waiting for a candy bar. Her dad does not order the candy bar, so she kind of leans in and says, Dad? candy bar you know the dad doesn't say anything so she thinks maybe her dad didn't hinder, hear her and so she leans in again and says daddy candy bar another man across the tavern hears her asking her dad for the candy bar he has sympathy and he buys her the candy bar she's torn because her parents have raised her that you never take anything from a stranger so she's looking at the candy bar she knows she wants the candy bar but she knows she's not supposed to eat it. Finally, wanting the chocolate gets the best of her, and she stuffs the candy bar in her mouth. Her dad finishes his beer, takes her to the house, drops her off. She runs in the house and gets lost all over again. Later that evening, the cops pull up, and as soon as they pull up, her uncle runs to the door her uncle opens the door. She hears the cop saying to the other cop, he did this to her with all these kids. Everything explodes. For Alexander, she carried that guilt for a long time. For five years, she did not speak. When folks are asking questions at the funeral about why did her dad do what he did, she runs and she hides because she knows why her dad did what he did. She knows that it's her fault for taking the candy bar. Blame and guilt are a part of grief. Sometimes we blame others. If I had a woulda, coulda sentiments, we regret not doing or saying something. We regret not being there. We regret not reconciling our differences we regret that we didn't say a certain something. One daughter, upon learning her mom had a stroke and died alone, wished she had not gone to work that day. She holds on to the guilt that she wasn't there for her mom. We get lost in some part of the past that felt right or perfect. But sometimes it's not us that blames ourselves. Sometimes the blame and the guilt gets put at our feet by others. Whether we feel guilty ourselves or whether it's put there, that is such a burden to take. Two parents lose their child, and each of them blames the other parent for the loss, when neither of them really are. When we are most stressed and often most hurting, we sometimes turn on one another with blame and guilt. It's easy to point the finger, relieve ourselves a little of the pressure we feel ourselves. We need to make the un 
explainable makes sense. Let's dive into this text. I'm sure you had a mouthful, and Paul did really good pronouncing the names of Job's friends today. I was like, if, if it was ever a great time for Paul to be picked to read the text, this was the day. With time on your head, it's really worth reading the whole book of Job. But today we'll just deal with the passages and the time period we're in. Talk about questions. Here is Job we learned on last week, having loss upon loss. We would call that trauma today. He is sitting in the first stage of grief. He is shocked. What just happened? What is going on? Um, God, you can interrupt me anytime. He wants to make it make sense, and he can't. He's been living his best life, and now life as he knew it is gone. All of his livestock, all of his nuclear family just gone. His wife went and opened her mouth, gone, wiped out. And he is empty like a building that has been gutted. He sits in disbelief at what has happened to him. The gravity of it all is too much to bear. And along comes his friends. And they actually model in the beginning for us the power of presence. They say nothing at all for a while. They sit with him, sunrise and sunset. The text tells us seven nights, seven days. Remember, we don't read it literally. We understand that it means a period, a good, good period of time. They stay for a while. They camp out with Job. They enter into his pain and anguish. They are just as perplexed as he is. It is a Jewish practice to sit with the grieving person for seven days. Seven days, seven nights. And so the friends sit, they stay. Now Job had a reputation for being a good family man. He was honorable and he had a great work ethic. In their sitting, they do what friends should do. They are there for the person when they are down on their luck or blessings. Never underestimate the power of just showing up for somebody, just spending time with someone, just supporting someone through their darkest moment just being there. They start out doing a really great job at being friends, but then they open their mouth. And a word of caution, the first part of this series says there is a time for everything. The first Sunday we talked about there is a time under the sun in Ecclesiastes for just about everything. There is a time for accountability. But this was not that time. There's a time for constructive feedback, but this is not that time. There's a time for thoughtful reflection, but this is not that time. There's a time when we have to learn from our mistakes, but this is not that time. There's a time when we face the person in the mirror, but this, this is not the time. Kim Bobo lost the love of her life, her best friend. She went out to Zuma that morning and returned home to find her husband dead in the bed. She was in shock. He he had the perfect bill of health. They were healthy. They worked out. What happened? This cannot be happening to me. Life was really good, and then, and then it wasn't. Kim was shocked by the advice, comments, and feedback folks provided for her. Are you going to sell your house? You don't want to live in this big house all by yourself, do you? The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh. God knows the appointed time of every soul. God must have wanted him home. He's in a better place now. God's plan. What a great way to go. And on and on the input came without her ever asking for it. By the way, grief is not about the person that is deceased or the loss. It's about the person that's still here and how they relate to the person that they lost. She knew deep down people were speaking from a place of love, but this was not the time. It was not the time for that. She thought to herself, is this what folks really say to people when they're grieving? And so after she got through a period of her grief, she wrote an article for the Chicago Tribune, entitled it, Etiquette of Sympathy. Here are a few words from her article. I've never had so much advice in my life. It became increasingly annoying. 
I finally told a family member, I'm not finding all this advice helpful. And in fact, it's making me mad. Perfect strangers who learned that I had experienced a death offered me very specific advice on what I should do and what I should not do. Try to keep yourself from offering advice unless you are asked. Sometimes in those awkward moments when we don't know what to say, we lean back to something we heard in the past and we let it come out of our mouth. What did Kim want to hear? What do people that are grieving want to hear? Kim said there are three ways to really, really, really hit it. Acknowledge the pain and shock. Offer concrete help. And lastly, share memories of the person. Job's friends, when they speak hurtful words, judging him, critiquing him, blaming him, that's what they got for him after seven days. I mean, if this much bad is happening to you, Job, what did you do? Blame is like a brisk, hard, cold smack across the face. And they smacked him over and over and over again. From what they saw, they were just trying to make it make sense. Even Job's sense of fairness was disrupted. He too struggled to make it make sense. It's ironic that when we can't make it make sense, we conveniently blame the victim. When we look at trans violence, well, if they weren't who they were, make it make sense. We look at domestic violence victims, well, why didn't she or he leave? Make it make sense. During the AIDS epidemics, well, God is trying to tell us something. Make it make sense. When people have hurricanes and tornadoes and two tsunamis and earthquakes and death is experienced, often all the body of Christ has to say, well, that's God's anger. God's mad with us. Make it. Make it make sense. Over in the New Testament, a boy gets sick. His parents are seeking out Jesus for healing. Meanwhile, the community is trying to make it make sense. And so they ask Jesus, who messed up? The boy or the parents? In other words, who's to blame for this bad thing happening to this child? Because the blame has to be put somewhere. Make it make sense. There's an old spiritual that says there are so many things about tomorrow I can't seem to understand. But I know who holds my future. And I know who holds my hand. Forget about tomorrow. There's so many things about yesterday and today that I can't seem to understand. Our brains are laced with questions and tragedy and trauma and things that do not make sense. Maybe they never will. Maybe some questions have no satisfying answer. Maybe we will sit like Job between the tension of pain and our faith. The first Sunday in this series, I said, hey, trust God in the moment. Last Sunday, I asked you to trust God with your pain. And today I'm saying, trust God with your future, even though it doesn't make sense. I wish more religious leaders and churches would just be honest and say, it doesn't make sense. People are hurting. And sometimes tragedy challenges us. It causes us anguish and grief. And we can be there for others without judgment and a need to make it make sense. Our presence is more important than our words. Just showing up. And we have that in God. Trust God with your future. Today, I began with a lady who lost her dad at five years old. She carried the weight of this suicide for a long time. Wedged in her mind was if she hadn't eaten the candy bar. 
her dad would still be with them. For over 40 years, she carried the guilt of killing her father. Now that's, that's heavy. And it jeopardized the quality of her life. And until she shared her story one day, she walked with that secret to herself. And in sharing it, she gave thousands of people permission to share their stories. Her story went viral. And because of her courage to be vulnerable, to speak the things that are taboo, others rushed forward with their stories that needed to be heard more than they needed to be understood. Grief, God's people, makes no sense. Losing a loved one hurts. Loss makes no sense. And like a too small shoe, it's dangerous. We, we try to force it to make sense. But do you know what makes sense? A loving, sympathetic God present to the plight of others. Do you know what makes sense? A community of faithful believers that show up again and again for each other. Do you know what makes sense? Arms and hands to hold others when they are hurting. Do you know what makes sense? Practicing love as an act of service, that makes a whole lot of sense. Do you guys know what else makes sense? Being present with others while they are going through. In the words of the Oriah Mountain Dreamer, the invitation, I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. You know what makes sense? Acknowledging people's pain, period. You know, want to know what makes sense? Being God's presence to those who are having it rough. Whenever and however, that makes a whole lot of sense. And trusting one day, now or later, that the person you will be able to trust with your future is God. That makes a whole lot of sense. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, the church means many things, and we thank you that today after church, we will be able to gather in conversation and talk about the church, what it's meant, what it means to us, what it means now, what it could mean. Dear Lord, all of us are on a journey and we are at different spaces on that journey. But we ask for your comfort and your peace while we are on this journey. And help us not only to be real about the joy and the blessings but to be equally real about the trials, the temptations, the struggle, and the grief. And you who began a good work in us, continue to follow us and continue to be by our side. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.